And I'm going to be going over the 12-game main slate we have here on Friday, August 18. Um, the Detroit-Cleveland game that was originally scheduled for this slate uh, has been removed because they are running the doubleheader shenanigans or, st I mean, whatever they're doing. Um, they, they moved it up. Could be for weather. Whatever. No matter, it's only 12 games uh, as opposed to the 13, and that's good because we don't really want to deal with Detroit and Cleveland. Uh, anyway, so a cursory look here. Um, we've got projections and, and ownership loaded. It's a Strider day. Um, you know, he's obviously leading naturally in both projection and ownership. Hefty figures coming to a couple of the guys up at the top. Not so much Brandon Woodruff in a very difficult matchup at a high price tag. Um, everybody else, though, I mean, we're not super thrilled about playing a lot of these guys. We'll go over this when we get to these games. But I'm kind of expecting quite a bit of offense here tonight. Uh, I think there's a good bit of attack ability in pretty much every one of these arms here uh, to a certain extent for one reason or another. So, um, you know, whether that's recent results or a price tag, I mean, there there's reasons that we can, uh, you know, we could argue against getting too excited uh, with any of these guys. Um, and that generally means that we're, you know, we could very well see a, a good bit of offensive production here tonight. Um, you know, weather-wise across the league, not all too warm. Looking, you know, mid-80s uh, or so pretty much everywhere. Um, you know, you got the outliers in Texas, those couple of games, uh, but those are in domes. Then you got the other outliers right out on the West Coast, San Diego, L.A., Oakland, uh, et cetera, a little bit cooler there. But for the most part... Um, you know, weather-wise, not looking too aggressive for this time in August. Um, you know, but if we got bad arms going on the mound, then, you know, it doesn't really matter. If they're pitching to a lot of contact, right, we could still very well see a lot of offense. So, that said, let's just get into the games. Got a couple of guys here that haven't been officially announced just yet. Um, notably, a Joey Lucchese for the Mets. It is going to be him. He's going to get called up. It uh, just does, has not happened just yet. Um, he's coming up from AAA. He's been hurt you know, for a little while dealing with a knee. Uh, who else? We also have Luis Medina, not officially announced for Oakland just yet. They do this opener nonsense, so don't be surprised when Oakland announces an hour and a half before the freaking game that Luis Medina is not going to be the ultimate starter. Uh, who else? Johnny Brito for the Yankees hasn't officially been announced yet either, I don't believe. Um at least as I had been doing my research here early in the morning. We are running a, a little bit behind here today, so I apologize about that. But uh, Fangrass made some pretty serious changes to their interface over um, the last week, and it has really thrown a wrench in my process. So, um, you know, a slight disclaimer here. Some of these numbers aren't going to be totally accurate. They're accurate enough for our purposes. Um, you know, but, uh, if I throw out a, a goofy number or something, don't hold it against me. That's why. In any case, let's just get into it. Philly and Washington to start off. Michael Lorenzen coming off a no-hitter. He no-hit Washington not five days ago. Um, and I want to fade that. He's been fantastic over his last five, six starts. And, however, you know, you guys, I probably know by now that I, I really like counter-trading momentum. Uh, when guys are performing outside of their uh, historical norms. And nothing really has improved all that much for Lorenzen. Uh, he's always had pretty good control, right, but never a big strikeout guy. And he's more of a finesse pitcher. 68% strike one, not a lot of swinging strikes. And that translates to just a 19% K rate. Doesn't give up a lot of power. Induces some ground balls to same-handed hitters. Right, and has five-ish, you know, call it with a with a little bit of a curveball, a little bit of a cutter uh, pitches to go to work with. Mostly a four-pitch guy, four-seamer, sinker, slider, change. Pretty good 
distribution here between those four pitches. It stays off of the two-seamer for the most part, gets to it with righties, and that helps him do some ground balls down in the strike zone with the slider as well. Um, and the four pitches that he relies on are mostly pretty plus here. So everything is, from a fundamental perspective, pretty good. From a DFS perspective, well, he's 9,200. He's coming off a no-hitter against this exact same team that doesn't strike out. And we're on a 13-game slate now. So I'm going to fade this. I'm going to try and get to some nationals here. Um, I generally obvi obviously have problems getting to full national stacks on full slates like this. But I do think there could be a little bit of value. C.J. Abrams is a slightly attractive price tag, kind of jumping off the page a little bit at 4,600 here today against Lorenzen. Um, Cabert Ruiz, 4,200. He's a four-hole catcher that doesn't strike out at all. And he's actually shown a good bit of pop recently, hopefully starting to come into his own as a big league hitter going forward. Uh, Lane Thomas, still good numbers against both righties and lefties this season. Joey Manessis been a little bit better recently as well now i'm not super thrilled with the price tags on you know the top four guys here dom smith in the five hole at first base 2600 he'll make that cheaper for you of course jake alou as well cheap and any of the guys down at the bottom of the lineup we don't really want to be playing them but they're fine in full five-man fillers if you or fine as fillers in full five-man stacks i should say uh if you choose to go that way I prefer probably just short stacks and fillers. I do think the the top four or five guys or, or whatever in any one of them or any three of them uh, are viable here taking shots against Lorenzen. I do like counter trading uh, momentum like this, and he's just too expensive. He's not a $9,200 arm, completely irrespective of his last five starts. For example, four starts ago, he's 5500 against the Royals, you know, Um He's been going deeper. He has five, six, and seven inning upside against a low upside offense on the other side in Washington. But, again, in back-to-back -back starts after he just no-hit them, uh, I'm going to side with the Nationals here and just not deal with the Michael Lorenzen. Joanna Doan going for uh, Washington. And we just have a, a really short sample for a Doan here uh, this season. Got a 5 ERA, expected metric, you know, pointing quite a bit lower, but it's still at four, which is not nothing. Um, you know, low strand rate so far, fine whiffs in the short sample. He's only seen 55 hitters. We can't take a hell of a lot out of this. So we mostly want to rely on the reliable metrics, and that's the strike one, right? 59%. It's not horrific, but we want this north of 60 to get super thrilled. Um I'm not going to do this going after Philly. I don't think we'll need to get all the way down here to 6,300, and he's not all that thrilling a play. Does have four and five in the tank as far as a pitch distribution, four-seamer, two-seamer, uh, curveball slider change. So that's fine. Slider at least appears to be you know, just kind of a show-me slider and a work in progress. Everything else could keep him down in the strike zone a little bit against same-handed hitters, uh, but... Against lefties, probably going to have a little bit of a susceptibility without being able to um, induce a lot of swing and miss. We see that here. Probably a, a noisy, pure strikeout rate at 26% because he's only got an 8% swinging strike rate so far. 25% CSW, you're not going to be able to sustain a 26% raw K rate. So a good bit of noise there. I think at the Phillies are in okay sort of middling and um you know off the board stack a little bit not going to see a hell of a lot of ownership they'll be pretty popular going after a um you know but not, certainly not one of the most popular teams they could be third on the list or fourth on the list or something depending on how things shake out throughout the rest of the day you know to the white Sox, colorado naturally maybe uh, Tampa, St. Louis, Minnesota, you know, all of these teams are going to be relatively similar uh, in ownership with Philly, and I think that makes them a, a viable tournament play. Price tags, they're very attainable here. Schwarber at 5000 is fine, and same thing with Bryce Harper, who went off against Gosman the other day. 5500 that's fine too. 4300 for Alec Bowman, it's an attractive price tag here. He doesn't strike out at all. Castellanos is fine. He's got fine numbers against right-handers this year at 45-2. Same thing with Bryson Stott in a low strikeout rate. Good numbers against righties. Um, you know, Trey Turner and JTR are still expensive down in the 6 and, and the 7 hole. 
but they're fine filler pieces in stacks because their ownership at those particular price tags is still going to be relatively capped. Um, so I want to get to some offense here in this game. Philly, yeah, for sure. Prefer full five stacks of them because they're just a, a more powerful and potent offense. But I do think a five-man Washington stack could be found as well. I'd prefer a shorter stack to get to a a more you know a higher upside five-man. But um, you know, the offense for me really in play a good bit. Okay, let's move on. Boston and the Yankees. Brian Bayo, 8,500. Yeah. All right. I, I kind of like pri playing Brian Bayo a little bit. Um, you know, sometimes maybe not necessarily tonight. He's got some hard contact issues to right-handers, even though he doesn't do so. A lot of ground balls. They got some fly ball hitters over here from the Yankees. I've been talking them up a little bit recently, um, even though I've also been dogging them quite a bit too. Like this offense just stinks. They are bad. Judge really hasn't gotten going since he came back, and that'll really do it to you when you've been out for two months. DJ has been terrible this season. He's down to 2,800 now. Um, you know, Glaber has really cooled off from, like, he was sustaining a lot of the offense when Judge was out. It was really just those two guys for most of the season. Now that Anthony Rizzo is out, he has also not been great this season. Stanton is terrible also. Um, you know, really not a very attractive offense. They're, like, they've had Isaiah kiner falefa in the five hole, <laughs> or leading off a lot of the time this year. Um, you know, pretty low upside, and not the typical Yankees. They are a stone average team here, right, reflecting in the record of 60 and 61. However, as I mentioned with Brian Bayo, he doesn't give up a lot of power necessarily, not a lot of batting average, but he will give up some hard contact. And to a couple of fly ball type of hitters, neutral ground ball to fly ball guys, like a Glaber, like an Aaron Judge, Stanton, uh, you know, for sure, if he can ever make contact, Harrison Bader, definitely. Uh, I think there's a little bit of upside for the right-handers here to perhaps get to some Bryant Bayo. This game is in Yankee Stadium, and we're seeing a, you know, four and a half-ish run total with a little bit of buy support there in a betting market. So, um, we could see some offense here pop from the Yankees. From the left side of the plate, a Billy McKinney, Jake Bowers. They're playable as well. Um, I want to be careful with the high strikeout guys from the right side that can't really lift a baseball, like an Anthony Volpe or even Stanton to a certain extent. He'll make enough hard contact, though, when he does hit it, uh, that will kind of negate that a little bit. So I think the Yankees are a little bit sneaky here. I could find a game stack because I, I kind of like going after Johnny Brito as well. Uh, I've attacked him quite regularly this season. He's got a lot of appearances, as a matter of fact. It's because the Yankees haven't had, I mean, they've had injuries. They've had, you know, dreadful performance from a lot of their guys. So Johnny Brito's just been kind of thrust into the rotation for a large part of the season. And he's very attackable, right? 220X ISO, 260 XBA. It's not overly high, but a 351 X Woba, that's an attackable figure too. Just an aggregate 18% strikeout rate here. We can go after some Johnny Brito with the Red Sox as well. Still a very powerful offense. Alex Verdugo here, 4,200, kind of jumping off the page for me. Masataki Yoshida should be back in the list. Um, they've given him a couple of days off to kind of clear his head. He's at 4,700. It's not super thrilling there, but he is a ground ball hitter. That doesn't strike out at all. And Johnny Brito's given up fly balls here and power to the left side with very few strikeouts at 14% and hard contact, 35% here to the lefties. Justin Turner's still a fly ball hitter from the right side. Rafi Devers, of course. Get into it with, with Trevor Story, too, at 4,800. Not wild about the price, necessarily, but I'm okay because of the lack of pure swing and miss which can be Trevor Story's weakness of some time, even though he's depressed the strikeout rate in the re in recent seasons. Tristan Cass has been excellent recently as well. So I've got no problem getting the top six. Jaron Duran, price tag adjusted uh, at 4,500. Not super thrilled there, but I'm okay playing pretty much any one of these guys. Pablo Reyes down at the bottom or either catcher Connor Wong, Reese McGuire behind the plate are fine, whoever is there. I think offense is is sneaky here um, because it, it's quite down the list in ownership so far. And I think there's some value attackability for Brian Bayo and Bolt and Johnny Brito as well on the mound. Um, and this is in Yankee stadium against some offenses with some capable hitters, even though the Yankees have been absolutely terrible and Boston, you know, for the most part, 
kind of break even as well, right? 103 WRC plus for them. They'll hit for some average and some pop. I think it's a sneaky offensive spot. I would have probably lead both of these guys off. Definitely no Johnny Brito for me. Uh, I could see getting to a little bit of Brian Bayo at 8,500 just because the, the Yankees have been horrific recently. Um, and they've got, you know, one really good hitter uh, in, in the lineup, and that's Aaron Judge, who has been not great since he came back either. So uh, a little bit of, of Bayo, but mostly just offense here for me. All right, San Francisco and Atlanta. We'll get to Strider in a second. Alex Cobb. All right, I, I think he could survive here because of the high ground ball stuff uh, against the Braves. They still do hit ground ball, despite all of the, the fly balls that they hit. Uh, they get a lot of good matchups, and they still have guys that can lift the baseball on occasion. This is a different sort of animal here when you get a guy that induces this many ground balls at 2.6 per fly ball. Does still give up some hard contact. But when you're inducing this many ground balls, two and a half, uh, I, I mean, you can really get away with this. Um, how I, I we've been able to attack Alex Cobb a little bit this season has been with lefties. There's a huge strikeout delta to the left side, just 15% here versus 28% to the right-handers. Um, he still gives up some batting average, right, at a full 275 XBA. It's a big, big number. And... When he's not inducing a full two and a half ground balls per fly ball and floating it a little bit, this two seamer, right? He still mains his pitch. If it's up in the strike zone a little bit, or if he is off a little bit with the slider, not feeling that necessarily, um, you know, he can be very attackable because he's not going to throw it past a lot of the left handers. And if the strikeout variance for him against the righties is on the downside, I mean, this is not the matchup that you want to be messing with any of that. Not that I'm necessarily you know, projecting downside of variance or anything. We don't want to play that game. Um, but from the, the pure metrics that we do have available, right, 7,900 that we got to pay for him, and, well, he gets Atlanta on the other side. This is still a very difficult spot. I think a lot of the upside for him could be capped in this matchup due to the, the large delta in the strikeout stuff. Still got to get through Michael Harris up at the top of the list and Matt Olson and Eddie Rosario um, in there from the left side of the plate. And Ronald Cunha, he didn't strike out at all from the right side this season, right? Austin Riley is a difficult out right there in the middle of the lineup as well. Historically, Marcelo Zuna, even though it's, it's elevated slightly this season, doesn't or has not uh, struck out at a, an egregious clip. He's typically been, you know, a sub-20% guy, even though he's, he's at about 23% or so this season against righties. Everybody from the Braves has been great. Uh, that not necessarily that means that I want to play them outside of, you know, Acuna. He's 68, so you got to stomach a price tag there. I don't really want to play Michael Harris, even though he's from the left side here. He'll make some contact. He still hits a lot of ground balls, so it's not a good batted ball matchup for him necessarily. Um, I think Alex Cobb could survive. I, I'm going to leave him on the shelf because I think the upside for him is capped in this matchup at this price tag. But this could take me off of some, you know, token Atlanta stacks. If you want to go after him, by all means, you got to have Atlanta exposure every single day in some fashion. Um, but these price tags for the guys you kind of do want to play, like Matt Olson, right? 6,400, that is not easy to get to. When Alex Cobb still, despite a low strikeout rate, induces a lot of ground balls to the left side. Um, He's a fine play. Wouldn't be shocked if, if Olsen got to him. Wouldn't be shocked if Michael Harris gets into a ball or something. Or an Eddie Rosario. They're fine. I'd probably, I'd just prefer the lefties from a raw contact perspective. Mix in an Acuna if you could make a price happen at 68. Maybe a Nicky Lopez down at the bottom or something like that. But I don't really want to go out of my way. I don't generally like stacking against Alec Cobb. I respect the ground ball stuff. And I respect the fact that he can manage some difficult lineups. Um when they're not overly left-handed heavy, and the Braves really aren't. Strider, we can get through this pretty quick. 33% uh, ownership, I got no problems with this because there's really not a lot of arms we want to play today. Um, and when we get the opportunity to play Spencer Strider, I, I mean, we kind of just have to take advantage, right? The problem with him is, well, number one, it's a price tag. And number two, it's a barrel rate. He's got a 10% barrel rate, gives up 37% hard contact, 080 ground balls per fly ball to the left side, the 22% line drive rate. This is attackable. He's got an 11% walk rate against left-handers. 
we go after these numbers sometimes, and despite the fact that he only gives up a 200 batting average, right, and not a lot of power, still a 165 ISO to righties. It's not nothing with fly balls. 140 ISO to lefties, not nothing with fly balls. It is reasonable, as we've seen a few times this season, Strider can get picked apart on occasion, what, two starts ago. Uh, he got taken apart by Pittsburgh, right? Just went two and a third, two and two thirds, excuse me, gave up six earned runs, struck out just three. He's had a couple of stinkers like that this season against some average and even in the case of Pittsburgh, below average offenses. He got taken apart by the Mets um, in kind of an island game where he got blasted for eight earned runs in four innings earlier in the year given up four against Texas. Um, you know, he'll give up some runs on occasion, five against the White Sox, for example. You know, he's done this, and at 12,700, it's not totally unreasonable if you fade this and just go elsewhere. I have no problems with that. And if you do that, um, you know, playing a couple of these left-handed pieces from San Francisco, notably some ground ball hitters, right, like a Michael Conforto, or, Conforto, excuse me, or guys with slight ground ball leans. Jock Peterson, historically a you know fly ball hitter generally, but this season dealing with the wrist injury and the hand injury, um, it's given him a bit more of a ground ball lean. Wade Meckler has been in the two-hole high upside hit tool for them. He's very cheap at 2,100. Lamont Wade, a little bit of a ground ball lean. 3,400, very cheap, and they should be very cheap. This is Strider we're talking about, uh, and he can still, despite a roughly average strikeout rate for all of these guys anymore. Um, or those pieces that I mentioned, this is still Strider. He's still got a 40% K rate. So play both sides in tournaments for sure and cast just each Strider and, and don't think twice about it. Um, don't look for hedge pieces. But uh, I think it's even viable to get to a couple of San Francisco uh, hitters here, notably Michael Conforto, Patty Bailey, even a Blake Sable. These guys are fine from the left side of play Jock Peterson. Definitely. It's still warm in Atlanta. It's still a hitter's ballpark down there. Certainly two left-handed hitters. Uh, it's viable to get to some of these guys in 20 max. Three max, probably a bit of a stretch, but um, very good leverage pieces over here from the Giants, as always, with Spencer Strider. But no no problems playing him or the Braves, really. But it's, it's price tags and, um, you know, lineup construction that you really got to manage. It, the, D, the Giants over here are, are pretty good DFS plays. All right, let's move on. Milwaukee and Texas. Brandon Woodruff on the mound, 10-9 in this matchup. I'm not. I'm just not doing this. Um, no, I, I like Brandon Woodruff, and I, I've got no problems playing, really, for the most part, at any time, a top 15 arm in baseball, and that's really what Brandon Woodruff is. Um, he's consistent, at least, you know, has been in his, what, four or five appearances this year. You know, each start above... Uh, 20 DK points, not necessarily overly buoyed by wins. couple of them, yeah, sure. But he's had some good matchups here. Cubs, St. Louis, Pittsburgh, and the White Sox in his four appearances. This is Texas, right? This is They're a far better offense than all these other guys. And at a very expensive price tag, it is a seasonal price high, at least, for him at 10-9. 10-9 is not cheap on a 12-game slate. I'm going to leave it off the sh leave him uh, on the shelf today, and that doesn't really mean I want to go after him with Texas necessarily. I still obviously respect him, um, but I'm going to have token Corey Seager every single day. I don't care who it is, it lefty, righty, it doesn't doesn't matter. He's 6600 now, which is where he should have been, you know, two and a half months ago. Um, but you have to have exposure to Corey Seager every single day uh, against everybody, pretty much regardless of the price tag. He's like Otani, he's like Judge, he's like Ronald Acuna. Um, Jordan Alvarez types like this kid is that good a hitter when he's healthy have to have some of him I'm not going out of my way though to be playing a Marcus Semien at 58 or an Addy Garcia at 54 necessarily um, if you get to a Texas stack here or there it's okay I think because they're a high upside offense but I'm not getting a lot of leverage against Brandon Woodruff by stacking some Rangers here so I'm not super interested there I'll probably just have some one-off pieces maybe like a Mitch Garver who could lift a baseball uh, something like that with my Corey Seager. I don't really want to go after Woodruff, and I respect him. That doesn't really mean I want to play him. Um, you know, similar to Reed Detmers the other day, however, 
he's still good enough to pick through any lineup in baseball. So from a, an ownership and DFS play perspective, the price is bad. Let's not get that confused. But the ownership is nice. And in baseball, uh, a lot of the time, you can't, certainly on a, a starting pitcher, when we're lacking value on the mound, you can get to some kind of overpriced, so to speak, starting pitchers and capitalize on very low ownership. We saw that uh, earlier in the season with Framber Valdez, for example, when he threw a freaking no, no hitter. So, it's viable to play Brandon Woodruff in tournaments at low ownership because he has the upside to take apart anybody. And we saw that, you know, even Reed Detmers, guy that's got serious holes, not nearly as many, um, or way way more, I should say, than Brandon Woodruff, you know, like good arms can take apart good offenses on any given day. So that's fine. Uh, but mostly a write-off for me due to pricing. And fundamental spot, Andrew Heaney is going for the Rangers. 77, I like this a little bit at low ownership. Now, I don't trust Andrew Heaney. I've talked about this pretty much every start with him. You can always play him because the strikeout upside can be there for him in tournaments in good matchups. And left-handers against Milwaukee have been doing this pretty much all season. They've been better recently, right, just in 89 WRC plus now. I say just because it was, whatever, 68 earlier in the season against lefties. Still a pretty high strikeout number here at 26%, but they've been better now that they've added Carlos Santana, and that number is going to continue to tick southward with him in the lineup. Um, they brought in Marcano, also doesn't strike out a hell of a lot either. You now, Willie Adamas is striking out enough for you know both of those guys put together. Um, they can platoon a little bit here, and that's always been Andrew Heaney's problem, right? Power to right-handers, fly balls, hard contact. That's how you can get after him. So I've got no problem playing a well-priced brewer here or there. Willie Adamas, he will strike out here. Um, but, you know, when he can connect, historically pretty good numbers against lefties for sure. Not going to hit for average, so it's just like a, a one-off homer hunting piece. Joey Weimer, power, but he's going to strike out too. Um, you know, Andrew Monasterio, that's okay. Carlos Santana's okay, even though you got to play him at first base. Willie Contreras behind the plate. At 47, great numbers against lefties. Kind of expensive, though. Um, so not my favorite getting to Milwaukee. Is there a bad offense? And at lower ownership, that's kind of why I'd rather side with Andrew Heaney here at 7,700. But I would not be surprised if he walks the whole country, then gets on the barrel and gets bludgeoned by a bad offense over here. Um, so there's variance with Heaney, but I think you would kind of have to, if you're building, certainly if you're building a lot of teams, you have to have some exposure uh, in this particular matchup. He could pop for 22, 25 here very reasonably. Uh, against Brewers, and at 7,700, that's, that's too valuable uh, on a 12-game slate. So uh, I think a little bit of Heaney here um, and some one-off pieces from an offensive perspective and probably no Brandon Woodruff for me. All right, let's move on. Seattle and Houston. I want to get to some offense here. Bryce Miller is on the mound. He's got serious attackability with left-handers um, and a little bit of hard contact issue and some fly balls to the right-handers. They got some good hitters over here from the right side and, of course, from the left side in Jordan Alvarez and Kyle Tucker that don't strike out, right? Josie Altuve probably should be back, uh, as far as I know. Um, and, unfortunately, he's 6,200. I don't really want to play him. Uh, Alex Bregman, 5,500, also doesn't strike out. His numbers are a little bit better historically against right-handers than left-handers, so that would put him fundamentally in play, but the price tag sucks. Uh, Kyle Tucker at 61 still, a very expensive. 6,000 for Jordan Alvarez. He's obviously the favorite. I do like Yiner Diaz here at 3,500 from the right side. And maybe a John Singleton if you need to make things cheap, and you would if you're playing any of the top four guys there. 2,800 at first base. Shown some pop since he has moved over to Houston. And they're giving him some run. Chas McCormick having, having an excellent season as well. 4,500. Tough to stomach that price in the seven hole. And Jeremy Pena is still trying to figure it out this season um, as the league is really adjusting to him. So short pieces, I think, here from Houston. Um, maybe even a game stack if you could make it happen with prices on the other side targeting some JP France. I don't really want to play Bryce Miller. I do like the lefties. Hard contact is a very serious concern here with a lot of fly balls, man. 41.5% hard with 060 ground balls per fly ball to, left, to the left side. Homers, line drives, power. That's concerning. Very few strikeouts to lefties. So everybody is really in play here for me. Um, 
from Houston and going after some Bryce Miller. I don't really want to deal with that. It's kind of an intriguing price tag for him, at least relative to where he's been historically. But this is a, not the matchup with everybody healthy over here on Houston. So I'm leaving uh, Miller on the shelf. JP France going for Houston, 8,700. I think he's overpriced. Uh, he doesn't have the raw swing and miss for me to get excited about going after Seattle, even though Seattle stinks. They've been much better recently, especially with Julio back at the top of the lineup. He's been great and really heating up once again. I want to get to him absolutely. At 5,500, I love playing right-handers in Houston, of course, because you got to hit it 212 feet to hit it out um, in left field. And JP France has power and fly ball problems to right-handers as well. 175 ISO there, 80 ground balls per fly ball, 35% hard. 22.5% line drive rate. That's attractive, and I want to play some right-handers against him. That's Gino. That's um, Julio, for sure, up at the top. And Ty France as well. He's playable 3,500. Tay Oscar is fine here at 38. His main problem, obviously, is strikeouts, and there's only a 15% K rate to the right side for J.P. France here. Um, now, he does have five pitches in the, in the quiver here. He's better against lefties, so I want to be careful with some of the cheap left-handed pieces like um, you know, Canzone in the outfield or Cade Marlowe or even Josh Rojas. Don't really want to be playing those guys here necessarily today. A lot of ground balls and very little power given up to the lefties by J.P. France here. That's the cutter changeup combination going to work. A little bit of the curveball too. So I want some right-handers uh, mostly. And if I could make a game stack happen or something like that, if I can't positionally then I've got no problem playing a little bit of Seattle going after J.P. France. I think he's overpriced. I think a lot of his upside in this particular matchup is capped. However, Seattle's still bad. Let's not get that confused. They've got a huge sample here of break-even metrics, even though Julio and Gino are starting to warm up a little bit. Um, they've had some good matchups recently. It's another good matchup, but J.P. France is a better arm than the matchups they've had recently. Like, J.P. France is not Jordan Lyles, right? So... I think uh, some offense here is is a little bit sneaky, to be quite honest, with uh, both Houston and Seattle. I like playing right-handed power when it's viable in Houston. So seems uh, pretty strong in tournaments to be getting to both of these teams. However, you can make that happen. No pitching here for me. All right, Pittsburgh and Minnesota. Um, and Andre Jackson is going for Pittsburgh. He's probably only going to go like three innings here. Uh, he's bullpen arm, right? Ten games and nine appearances out of the bullpen this season. Um, short sample noise still. He's only seen 100 hitters, so he can't take a hell of a lot out of it. Does have four pitches. Three and a half, I guess. Just with the show me curveball here. But uh, really up and down in the value so far. 59% strike one is, uh, you know, it's, Okay, I suppose. 11.5% barrel rate is not okay. Um, great walk rate here in the short sample. Sub 5%. That's fantastic. He's going to throw some strikes, which is nice. Uh, good thing for the Twins. Um, but he might have a little bit of strikeout stuff in him, right? And he could have some ground ball stuff, at least against the left-handers, that are going to be in platoon matchups against him for the Twins. Uh, with the cutter change up down, right? So he's susceptible so far in giving up a good bit of power. Expected metrics, 225x ISO, 350x Woba, 275x BA. These are attackable, 38.5% hard contact, mostly coming from right-handers. But again, we got, you know, short sample noise uh, to flesh out. If you want to go after him, I got no problem here. It's going to be mostly a bullpen game, though. And he is semi-stretched out for about three innings. If he can survive with some swing and miss here against the Twins, which we know is obviously a problem for them, then Pittsburgh going to be able to piece together some bullpen arms to make it even more difficult for the Twins to realize a lot of upside. So generally, I hate playing the Twins because they are terrible. Um, but their price tags kind of force the hand a little bit sometimes. Eddie Giuliani, he should be in there. Who knows what the hell... Baldelli's going to do over here, but uh, he's still 3,200, and he's still a killer second base play leading off. Georgie Polanco is still fine at 46, hitting from both sides at second and third base. Correa, we can get to some right-handed power here, right? Um, or, you know, guys with you know, standing on the right side of the plate. Uh, and that would be Correa at 4,500, or Royce Lewis, right, 3,200. 
very playable price tags. You can play Christian Vasquez or Ryan Jeffers, either one of the guys behind the plate, and pretty much anybody down at the bottom. Joey Gallo, obviously. Michael Taylor is fine in high upside matchups for him. Of course, Matt Walner, Kepler, you know, whatever in the middle. So it's fine getting to some twins, and unfortunately, they may see a little bit of ownership due to their price tags as filler stacks. So that that's how I prefer to play them as fillers. It's just so hard to get there with a bad offense on a 12-game slate that strikes out at a 27.5% clip against right-handed pitching. They do hit for power, however, will walk some and lift the baseball with, you know, 30 foot above average, 34% hard contact here. Uh, that's attackable. And, and we can go after some Andre here, and certainly the a Pittsburgh bullpen a little bit. No problems really playing the Twins, but in excess excess exposures, I'd probably prefer to um, you know be a little bit careful. Pablo Lopez going for them, 10-6. This is a guy above 10,000 I, I really want to play if I can't get all the way to Strider at 12-7 or whatever he is. Um, 30% ownership, I got no problems here, and I've got no problems with the matchup, right? 90 WRC plus for Pittsburgh here. As I mentioned, we got to take some of these numbers with a little bit of a um, you know, grain of salt here because they're not fully updated in the last couple of days, but they're close enough. 24% strikeout rate, 231 batting average I'm really attracted to from Pablo's perspective. Buck 62 ISO, slightly above average, but nothing uh, super concerning here as an opposing starting pitcher, that is. 32% hard contact and, you know, roughly neutral ground balls per fly ball, 306 Woba. Pretty average creation um, and danger that uh, Pittsburgh is presenting against right-handers. And I've got no problems whatsoever in Pablo's plate discipline. Every single metric here is pretty fantastic, uh, top to bottom. The only susceptibility I could really see is a slight fly ball lean with a few line drives to the left side of the plate. But he's got five pitches here, really good distribution, sweeper sort of split change a little bit that he's working with, um, that he brought in this season. We talked about that, you know, in the early part of the year. But curveball is plus, slider is plus. I mean, that is kind of the the sweeper here. Two seamer is plus, uh, inducing ground balls to the right handers. He's staying off of it to lefties. Um, you know, so I've got no problems here. Everything is great. I love the upside, and I I think a 30% ownership here is very much playable, as is 10-6 on a 12-gamer. So let's uh, let's do it. I like Pablo and some correlated, probably short stacks for me, um, twins pieces from an offensive perspective. Just going to stay off of most of Pittsburgh here, but you know if you want to play a token Jack Sawinski against a right-hander, um, that's okay. Or maybe, maybe, maybe like a Brian Reynolds, something like that. ND behind the plate because he's cheap. All right, whatever. But uh, really not interested in Pittsburgh for the most part. All right, Mets, St. Louis. Uh, Joey Lucchese is going to be going for New York. Um, as I mentioned at the outset, he's had kind of a knee issue he's been dealing with for about a month and a half or so. Short sample, he's been in AAA. Um, now, with Joey Lucchese, he hides the baseball well, right, from the left side up here. And he's got kind of this herky-jerky motion for anybody that's been following him. You know, for several seasons, came up at the Padres, had some upside, but he's never been a pure strikeout pitcher, which has really led him astray. He's only been about a three-pitch guy, and you sometimes need, I mean, you need at least three-plus pitches um, in, in the big leagues to be a starting rotation type of piece, and Lucchese has never been able to develop that fourth pitch. So the four-seamer has, for the most part, been pretty good, but he's relied really a lot of his for a lot of his career on a two seamer with a marginal change and he uses two seamer very heavily he's always given up excuse me production and power to right handers right and we see that kind of materializing here a little bit in the short sample this season still 45 percent hard contact with fly balls and power 236 iso to the righties so far um don't want to take too much out of the numbers right he's been efficient he's always been a pretty effective strike thrower but he pitches to a lot of contact without a hell of a lot of swing and miss and we see that materializing to just a seven percent swing and strike rate here this season so i want to go after him with cardinals they're a very viable stack here today and very well priced outside of goldschmidt and Arenado, who you have to pay for very good numbers of course for all of these guys notably wilson Contreras at 3900 got fantastic numbers against lefties this season tyler o'neill is once again playable jordan walker has great numbers too, 
and he's a high ground ball hitter so far in his debut season. 3,100 in the outfield. He'll likely be in the middle of the lineup here. Batted ball profile-wise is a really good matchup for him as Lucchese does give up balls in the air. So I like Jordan Walker a good bit, and you know pretty much anybody in the top six. I'm not necessarily going to want to mess around with anybody in the bottom third. Taylor Motter, Mason Wynn, Luke and Baker types, any of this garbage. We don't really want to screw around with that. Um, at least I don't on a full 12 gamer. I'd rather get to the guys I'm super confident in, and that's really two through six. So yeah, even uh, Tommy Edmond from the right side, he'll likely lead off here. So that that's fine too. Cardinals, very viable stack. However, no multi-position eligibility for them, or flexibility, I should say. Um, so it's going to be pretty uh, popular in terms of, you know, all of your Cardinal stacks are going to be relatively similar, I should say, uh, to other Cardinal stacks. So something to keep in mind if their ownership kind of steams. But they're a very viable stack here today. And I like going after some Lucchese um, and, and the power he gives up. Zach Thompson is going for the Cardinals. He's likely just going to uh, you know, go a couple innings as well. 5,600, He's, I mean, he's capped at like four innings maybe, and like he needs to be cheaper than this if we're going to consider eating something like that on a full 12-gamer like this. You need upside, and he's just not going to have it. Do we want to go after him? I think it's okay. I generally don't like playing the Mets on full slates, but... Zach Thompson also giving up a little bit of pop to right-handers here this season. 175 ISO. Exhibiting some strikeout stuff, uh, definitely. That's the four-seamer. And the curveball slider going to work a little bit, but he's given up some hard contact. He'll induce ground balls, however. Um, so I'm much less on the Mets than the Cardinals, right? You just need fly balls. You need hard contact and balls in the air and not on the ground. Um so if I'm going to play anybody, it's, it's somebody that can lift a baseball. Pete Alonzo, of course, 53. Frankie Alvarez, sure, at 4,000 uh, if he's even, you know, in the starting lineup. Um, Jonathan Arauz has been really strong recently, seeing the baseball as he's getting more ABs up at this level. Dual eligible, you know, in, in the infield there at 2,300. That's a fine piece. Um you know, Abe Almani has historically got okay numbers against lefties, whatever. You can always play Frankie Lindor, of course, too. And even Nimmo is not a zero against left-handed pitching. You could find a Mets stack. I'm not super thrilled with it. I prefer just a short stack of the power hitters uh, and maybe like a, a filler Arauz, um, you know, in the infield to make it cheaper. So that's how I kind of want to approach this game. No pitching for me and mostly just offense once again. And we're going to go through the same spiel here at Coors Field um, with Michael Kopech and Peter Lambert on the mound for the White Sox and the Rockies. Um, very little pitching for me, and I say very little. That might be surprising because I think Kopech could actually survive here. Um, I think that the price tag at 7300 is semi-attractive, to be quite honest, even though he's been given a power in spades. Hard contact, fly balls, uh, like these are bad, bad numbers. Right, not so much in batting average necessarily, but it's barrel contact, 14% barrel rate in aggregate this season for Michael Kopech, and a 15% walk rate. So that's why I don't want to play him. You cannot walk people at Coors Field, and you cannot give up balls in the air with this type of hard, hard contact on the barrel at Coors Field. Um, that's very, very dangerous. So that's why I say, you know, very, very little. And that you know the field here kind of agreeing. However. Still 23.5% above average strikeout rate for Michael Kopech, and this is still a below average offense uh, in terms of creation, even though they play half their damn games at Coors Field. All right, 81 WRC+, plus. this is park-adjusted, 25% strikeout rate for the Rockies here. Hit for a little bit of average, but it's like average average at 255 Below average slightly at buck 52 ISO. Hard contact is there, and line drives are still there. Um, but the walk rate is, you know, nothing super impressive. Kopech is overly susceptible, though, um, to just not being able to throw strikes. And that's why I think it, it, for the most part, takes him out of play. But if you land on a 7,300, this is a super shrewd, deep tournament play. It is not the craziest. And you would not get a, you know, staunch argument from me. 
Um, but be prepared if he walks five guys and you know gives up seven runs in two and two thirds. Don't be surprised. Uh, Peter Lambert going for Colorado and same sort of deal with him. He's been a little bit better recently, surviving a little bit longer as he's getting more consistent work at the big league level. But he's still a young arm and he's still got some serious holes here. Changeup is not good. Four seamers just break even, and he's only got effectively three pitches. Curveball is a work in progress for him that you can't really throw at Coors Field. So he's got to just dump this pitch and and mix in hopefully a cutter to try and minimize the contact he's giving up against the left-handers here. Uh, 208 ISO, 15% strikeout rate. He's got to be able to induce more ground balls and more soft contact. Uh, you can't give up 40% hard contact in the opposite end of a platoon when you're going to throw a lot at Coors Field. You just can't do it. 10.5% barrel rate for him as well. Um, I'm much more inclined to play Kopech even at a $2,000 more expensive price tag because, well, I trust him more to be able to throw it past guys than I do with Peter Lambert. Um, offensively, the White Sox are a bad offense, right? They are also just an 84 WRC plus creation offense. Average power, below average, below average hard contact. You know, they hit for 2% less batting average than even Colorado does. Same strikeout rate, roughly, no walk rate, a lot of ground balls. Now, um, Tim Anderson is going to be out tonight. I believe he is suspended for throwing a punch a little while, like a week ago or whatever, uh, at Josie Ramirez. The ground ball to fly ball ratio here for the White Sox is largely inflated due to his numbers that are out of control high in the ground ball uh, percentage department. So in aggregate, this would probably come down for the lineup that the Sox roll out tonight. Um, you know, nevertheless, you still need guys that try and lift the baseball. That's Luis Robert territory. You can obviously play some White Sox here, but this is a bad offense, and they're going to be very popular here today. Uh, they're cheap enough, and they're they're underpriced for the relative upside that any offense offers at Coors Field against you know a guy that pitching to 80% contact like Peter Lambert. Um, so I've got no problem playing them, but like they're going to lead off Elvis Andrews, who is you know Elvis Andrews, right? He's 3,400 dual eligibility, so fine, play him. Go ahead. Yoan Moncada is still 4000 There's upside for these guys at these price tags, certainly with Aloy as well and Andrew Benintendi at 3800 Yes, Yasmani Grandal, of course, a lot of history at Coors Field, having been with, uh, been in the National League and with the Dodgers for so long. Um, you could play all of them. I got no problems there. It's just ownership you're going to have to balance. And with a bad offense, I want to be careful. They're similar to Minnesota, similar to Seattle. Um, they're... They're poor offenses, and even though they're in very good spots, oftentimes that inflates their ownership. We saw what, um, you know, the other night against Javier Assad, for example, attackable spot a little bit in a win in a win game, but like, you know, the the offense just isn't very good. So you got to be careful with that when you need a lot of ownership on them. But uh, offense mostly here, maybe a little bit of Kopech and deep tournament stuff. All right, uh, Tampa and the Angels offense here too for me. Uh, Rasmo Ramirez also just going to open, going to go just a couple innings, maybe three, four, something like that. So for all intents and purposes, a bullpen game for Tampa. Can't really play him, uh, even though it's a right-hander against the Angels, who are garbage. Uh, they're going to be calling up a in really kind of a, a super shocking move, a guy they drafted literally a month and a half ago, uh, the Angels. He's a left-handed first base bat for him. He's a college hitter, um, but... Like, like he's not in the DK player pool, so you can't play him. Um, but that th will give them a, at least somebody from the left side of the plate. Um, it's uh, it's Nolan Shanuel, I believe is how his last name is pronounced. Um, went to, where did he go? To uh, FAU, and they just drafted him in the first round. Um, you know, 11th overall. So they're, they're very high on him, and they've only given him 100 plate appearances in the minors. So... Um, they may very well have him in the lineup tonight. And that is a left-hander, uh, which could make, you know, any bullpen shenanigans that they're going to play over here. Uh, and for Erasmo Ramirez with, 
um, some power issues to the left side of the plate, at least in this short sample this season, a little bit more uh, concerning, right? So, of course, they've still got Moniak and Otani and Moustakis and, and Red Hifo and Matt Dice that you can play that are in the player pool. Um, so I've got no problem playing some of these guys over here, notably if we're going to go after um, Ramirez. It'd preferably be with fly ball hitters, right, from the left side. He's given up 42% hard contact to lefties so far. Um, and that's Moniac territory. That's Otani mostly, right? So I've got no problem getting to those guys if you can make a 6,700 Otani happen. Uh, on the other side, I also want to stack Tampa. They're a very viable stack as well, popping right up there with St. Louis and, uh, you know, Philly and all these kind of middling sort of teams. I want to go after Tyler Anderson. He didn't throw it past anybody, just 19% K rate. He's efficient early in the count, and he is a fly ball pitcher, which can make him frustrating to stack against with right-handers sometimes because he induces a lot of fly balls um, and a good bit of soft contact with the cutter-change combination. So he can be frustrating. I'd prefer to get to, like, a Randy, Yandy, Diaz, Harold Ramirez types. I prefer Isak, actually, against right-handers, as a matter of fact. Uh, Josie Siri in the outfield, that's fine. 3,800. Um, Basabe down at the bottom as, as shortstop while Wander Franco is still on the restricted list. You could do that. Christian Bethencourt from the right side has always hit left-handers really well. No problems getting to anybody from Tampa. You can stack the whole country over here um, with the Rays. And if you can make game stacks here happen, you know, 80, 85 degrees, whatever, in L.A. tonight, also a fine weather spot. Angel Stadium actually plays up offense a little bit more, bit of a hitter's park. So no problems uh, playing pretty much anybody uh, offensively here uh, from either side. I'm going to stay off of 7,100 Tyler Anderson. I don't think he has any upside. Maybe he can survive like five, six innings, but I think he's capped at probably like 20 points here. Maybe he squeezes a win out of it or something. Um, you know, but give me just offense for the most part here. Okay, Arizona, San Diego running a little long here, trying to speed things up. Brandon Fott, no thanks. Uh, his numbers are terrible. Uh, top to bottom, I want to play San Diego, and they're not seeing any ownership right now, probably because they're mostly expensive. There's a lot of other offenses you'd – maybe prefer to get to, but I want to play San Diego for sure. Uh, so 18% strikeout rate to the right-handers here, 45% hard contact, 2.5 homers per 9, 080 ground ball to fly ball. That's to, just to the right-handers. He's also giving up the 300 batting average to lefties as well, 250 ISO, you know, a few more strikeouts, but like whatever, you got to get through Juan Soto and Jake Cronenworth who don't strike out a lot uh, from the left side. Same ground ball to fly ball ratio at 080, 085 or so. A little less hard contact, but look at these line drive rates, man. 26% in aggregate, 29% to lefties, 24% to right-handers. Um, high barrel rate, 11% here. No walk rate. I'd really like that to be a little bit higher to make it just an absolute smash play. Uh, I think it is anyway, to be quite honest. I want to stack a lot of San Diego. And if anybody watched or looked at the StatCast data from the game last night, Zach Gallen was exceptionally lucky to get out of that game alive. He is very, very fortunate that he didn't give up a six spot. San Diego was hitting the baseball very hard all night long. I don't know the exact number, but Gallen gave up a ton of hard contact. It seemed like every other hitter like hit a ball to the wall uh, or down a line and right at somebody. Um, he was very lucky to get out of that game alive. So that said, I want to play San Diego because they're seeing the baseball and they saw it really well against a very, very good arm. Brandon Fott is not Zach Gallen, but they do exhibit similar batted ball profiles. They give up a lot of hard contact. Both of them do. So I want to play San Diego again. Um, you cannot hit the ball consistently that hard and have it not fall in like, they, they were very unfortunate not to get there. I didn't stack them. I, I, I played Zach Allen last night, uh, but I watched a game, and it was a gulp fest from start to finish. So I want to play San Diego, and they're not going to get all that much love um, you know, in the markets today. So I want to play them. 
you know, I think even eight and a half to five in the betting markets is a fine addition uh, if you can stomach, you know, laying nearly two to one on a guy um, or on a team. Seth Lugo, yeah, maybe not, right? 19% ownership here. I'm kind of concerned. Um, you know, Arizona has been poor recently, right? Really poor since the All-Star break or, excuse me, for, since the trade deadline. But they are starting to heat up a little bit. Um, as I said, I was pretty tuned into that game last night. Their offense, uh, despite, you know, being pretty poor, um, you know, they, they still got some really confident hitters down here that are starting to streak a little bit. Uh, Christian Walker, he's been streaking for a little while. Tommy Pham as well. Corbin Carroll is Corbin Carroll. Cattell Marte got a day off last night. He should be rested and back in there this evening. Lord Escuriel also out last night should be back in there today too. Um, so I've got no problem playing a little bit of Arizona here as well. I like going after average, below average arms with Arizona, at, certainly from the right side, um, as we've talked about really all season. So you actually get a little bit of leverage here. If you can make some price tags happen, I think this is, once again, excuse me, a viable game stack. Getting to uh, Arizona and and San Diego. Um in what's going to be a totally off-the-board game. Nobody's going to be playing either of these teams, so you don't even have to just stack the game to get different. You can play either of them, you know, on their own. Uh, now, 7,500, slightly attractive price tag for Seth Lugo. Does have average, just slightly above average strikeout stuff, uh, but he's attackable very much so with left-handers. He's got terrible numbers against lefties. 275 batting average, 346 Woba, and a 228 ISO. Strikeout, sure, but hard contact at 38%. They got some line drive and fly ball hitters over here from the left side, notably Corbin Carroll, Cattell Marte, Jace Peterson, fly ball hitter from the left side as well, even though he strikes out and kind of stinks. Um, I want to play a little bit of offense over here, lower strikeout rate to the righties, so that puts Christian Walker, Tommy Pham, Lourdes Gurriel in play from the right side. So I think it's sneaky for Arizona. Not a favorite stack necessarily, but uh, I mean, the Padres are, are one of my favorites. I, I really do like them given the, the ownership adjustments here um, or suggestions here in the better, in the market so far in the early going. Okay, let's move on. Baltimore and uh, Oakland probably get through this game pretty quickly. Kyle Gibson, I do not – I hate playing Kyle Gibson, man. He is – I've said it so many times this season. He's been this way his entire damn career. He is the definition of average, and I don't like paying – uh, what's kind of an expensive price tag for a an average arm. I I would not be surprised here if Kyle Gibson just tears apart Oakland. He does this sometimes, but I also would not be surprised if Kyle Gibson completely shits the bed and gives up five earned in, in four and a third, strikes out one or two guys. He may even strike out like seven, but also give up five runs. You know, like, he is so enigmatic and so difficult to peg. Um... It's really difficult, at least for me, to have a, a strong take on Kyle Gibson. Um, you know, really, no matter the matchup. I know this is in Oakland. He gets a very bad offense. But are they really that bad? I don't know. 89 WRC plus for them in aggregate this season. we got a huge sample, right? We're in the middle of freaking August here. Yeah, they're going to strike out a little bit and not hit for any average. But they will create, and that's mostly due to, um, you know, getting on and, and stealing some bases and opportunistic, um, you know, hitting with, like, runners in scoring position and, and things like that. So they can create a little bit, and Kyle Gibson, uh, I, I just don't trust the guy. So what I'm going to do at high ownership is just come off of it. I don't like the price tag. Uh, I think they, you know, with every $100 with Kyle Gibson, you – uh, you incur a lot of risk. <laughs> and uh, I think $100 with Kyle Gibson means a hell of a lot more than it does, does for some other pitchers because he is break-even. The value that he gets on all of these pitcher or all of these pitches, rather, is zero exactly. Uh, so, like, there's no telling with him what's going to be bad on any given day. He can survive because he's pretty respectable in aggregate against right-handers. But he's terrible against left-handers. And if he's at all bad against right-handers and bad against lefties, then he just gets blown apart. You know, so it's, it's very hard for me to peg it. And 
I'm just going to stay off of it at high ownership and what I think is a an elevated price tag. So I'll just go elsewhere, and if it burns me, it burns me. Uh, Luis Medina is going for the A's. 6,800, I think he's overpriced for this matchup too. 11.5% um, walk rate. I do not want to deal with, with a sub-50% strike one rate against Baltimore. I think Baltimore could be a viable stack. They're probably going to be a little bit popular for you know being in Oakland, 65 degrees tonight in a huge ballpark, against a guy that does have a little bit of survivability in him. Um, you know, with 24% K rate to righties and some ground balls, right? He can induce ground balls here, and that could keep him in in line a little bit. But he gives up power still to right-handers, 220, and just a 20% K rate to the lefties, right? So with all these walks and a little bit of susceptibility, I'm not going to go after him, uh, go after Baltimore with him, that is. So... Does that mean I really want to play Baltimore? Well, I like the price tags for sure. 4600 for Gunner is attractive. Um, Anthony Santander, 4000 I like that. Ryan O'Hearn, 31 I like that. Cedric at 43 I like that. Adley, uh, you know, Rutschford at 4800 at uh, leading off is great, but he's in Oakland, right? At, and he's a catcher at 4800 on a 12-game slate. Not my favorite because he walks so much. Um, I think he's going to walk a lot here in this particular matchup. So... I'd probably prefer to stay off him, maybe get to some short stacks at Baltimore as opposed to five stacks, like Gunner, O'Hearn, Cedric, something like that, maybe throw in a Santander or whatever. Um, if you want it, yeah, you could find a five stack here. That, that's fine. Uh, I'd prefer a, a three-man um, as they are kind of down the board a little bit in ownership, and I think that's a, a viable route to go. So no pitching here for me, uh, despite this being in Oakland. Uh, I just don't really trust either of these guys, nor do I like their numbers. Okay, last game here, Miami and the Dodgers. Tough spot here for Sandy. Uh, 9,600, I, I really don't like the price tag. I need some more strikeout stuff out of him. He's still, unfortunately, only hovering at about a K an inning, uh, which is fine, right? This is the Dodgers. They don't strike out a hell of a lot. I mean, we, we did see what uh, Corbin Burns did to them yesterday, right? Um, you know, with the lack of J.D. Martinez in the middle of the lineup, who the hell knows if he's going to play? Uh, whether it's a hamstring, the back, or or Dave Roberts, or I mean, I off the field, like who the hell knows? Without him in the middle of the lineup stabilizing things, they really only have four good hitters, and that's Mookie, Freddie, Will Smith, and maybe a Max Muncie if you want to consider him a good hitter. So Sandy could very much be in play. He's been far better recently. We've been waiting all season for the regression, the positive regression to hit for Sandy. The plate discipline outside of the pure strikeout stuff has still just been fantastic, right? No walk rate, 65% strike one, elite chase at 36%, and a 27% CSW. This is all still fine. It's the very low strand rate that has plagued him all year. You know, whip is only at a buck 15. This is a great figure. Doesn't get barreled, and he still induces a lot of ground balls. Doesn't give up a lot of power, right? So we've been waiting for the positive regression to finally set in, and sure enough, in his last, you know, three of his last four starts... Um, have been fantastic. He's got two complete games and another eight-inning appearance, right? So this is the Sandy of last season that we're seeing. At 9,600, even against the Dodgers, if this is the Sandy of last season, we're still seeing him underpriced. At 5%, sub-5% ownership, that puts him, that has to put him in play, especially if J.D. Martinez is out again tonight because the, the lineup over here is attackable and weak. It's the strikeout stuff that I'm worried about. Um, at 9,600, I do think it's still going to be very difficult to get through Buki, Freddie, and Will Smith at the top without any strikeout stuff. So that's what would take me off. I probably wouldn't argue too much with you if you landed on Sandy. And, you know, in single entry, three max, I don't think you need to get that crazy. In 20 max, I think this is a viable play. Um, I would not be surprised if he gives up a five spot or something and has kind of a clunker. This is still the Dodgers. But I do think he is in play. Everything outside of the pure strikeout rate and like a hard contact rate to left-handers is still very, very good for Sandy. So uh, still looking for the strain rate to continue to tick up and and the ERA to continue to tick down as he strands more batters or strands more runners, I should say. Uh, so I have no problem playing him if you want to get there a little bit. But it, it's pretty low ownership. I don't think you need to get wild with it. You get to 10%. I think that is plenty. Um, offensively, 
you know, from the Dodgers, uh, I don't really want to play anybody. Maybe a Max Muncy. Like, you always play Freddie Freeman, but they're at their normal price tags. But, you know, so I'm not super thrilled there, uh, to be quite honest. Um, Tony Gonsolin going for L.A., 8,000. Fine price tag against Miami, but, like, I don't know. Is it really? Like, 22% strikeout rate for Miami. A lot of ground balls here, so that's a problem. 250 batting average, that's you know, league average. Buck 40 ISO, that's kind of a problem too. But they play a lot of their games in Miami here. 91 WRC+. plus. They can still create a little bit. And that's mostly due to Luis Arise getting on base so damn much. Um, I got this, no problems really playing a little bit of Miami here as a way off the board stack. Georgie Soler, I think, is fine at 5,200 in this matchup. His problem is strikeouts against right-handers. And Tony Gonsolin... He's only striking out 17% of right-handers this season. Still giving up a 150 ISO. Left-handers, Gonsolin's giving up a 42.5% hard contact with a fly ball lean and a buck 60 ISO there. So that's Luis Arise territory, even at an expensive 4,700. And a Jazz Chisholm, for sure, at 51. I think this is a really good play. You play a uh, Jesus Sanchez or something like that. Um... Even a Jake Berger, whose problem is strikeouts. He is, against right-handers at least, a little bit of a ground ball lean. It's a fine spot for him to make some hard contact and try and lift the baseball. I think you could find a Josh Bell here at first base, 3,400, getting you know more regular at-bats now with Miami instead of Cleveland. Um, and Washington, or wherever the hell he's been in the last couple seasons. So I think... Miami's a viable stack going after Gonsolin. Not going to get a lot of leverage. So that kind of stinks, but I don't really want to play Gonsolin. He's not all that impressive. The strikeout stuff is gone. It's not up in the 24, 25% range where it was last year. Uh, he's still efficient, still down in the strike zone with the split, which is still a good pitch, but he's given up a 10% barrel rate and too much hard contact. So I think that's attackable here with Miami. You want to play a correlated Sandy Alcantara stack um, or team with the with the... Marlins here? Oh, okay. I, I don't think this is horrible. So, really off the board. Um, nice late slate play, I think. You probably see more ownership there, but, like, whatever. Um, no Dodgers, for the most part, for me. You can always play them, like, whatever. But uh, I'm kind of on Miami here, and you're catching twenty in the betting markets right now. I don't think this is horrible. Probably prefer that to be a little bit better, a little bit higher. But... Uh, there might be a little bit of value on the Marlins here tonight. I think they're interesting in DFS, too. Okay, we're done. Let's review really quick so we can get out of here. Um, Philly, Washington. Lorenzen, no thank you. I'm fading him uh, as a momentum play. Same thing with you on a don't. No pitching here for me. I, I do like Philly, and I like a little bit of Washington. Uh, Boston and the Yankees, maybe a Brian Bayo team or something going after the Yankees because the Yankees are garbage. Johnny Brito, no thank you, uh, but give, give me offense mostly. I, I think the Yankees are very viable here. You could find some game stacks um, at Yankee Stadium. I think that's a, a pretty viable construction. San Francisco, Atlanta, you can leverage some San Francisco pieces here against Spencer Strider. He's going to be 35 and 40% owned, probably even higher than that in a lot of stuff. Um, and he's got problems to left-handers. Fly balls, hard contact, and barrels. So, yeah, play him, definitely, if you can make a construction happen that you like. I got no problem there. But uh, leverage pieces are very much in play. No Alex Cobb for me against the Braves. I, did, I think the upside is capped for him at 79 due to the strikeout delta between righties and lefties for him. But I like the ground ball stuff. I think he could survive. That could take me off some Atlanta. Milwaukee and Texas, no Brandon Woodruff. I think he's too expensive here for this particular matchup. Give me some Andrew Heaney and absolutely some Corey Seager. Uh, Corey Seager always. A little bit of Andrew Heaney. I like the price tag a little bit. Do really like the matchup, but super dangerous. You want to get off the board and leverage some um, you know, Milwaukee right-handers against that, I have no problem there. Seattle and Houston, uh, Bryce Miller, no thank you. J.P. France, no thank you. I want to get to offense here in Houston. Right-handers mostly, but uh, left-handers targeting Bryce Miller's pretty pronounced split here is absolutely viable. It's price tag because you got a balance from Houston. Um, that's really what takes me off, but I, I really like Yander Diaz and, of course, Jordan Alvarez from the Astros from Seattle. Julio has got to be the favorite play there, I think. Uh, Pittsburgh and Minnesota. Uh, only Pablo Lopez on the mound here. No Andre Jackson, of course. Very little Pittsburgh. Probably just none. I'm gonna just going to eat all the Pablo that I can tonight. And maybe some Twins. Uh, like, okay, but they're a terrible offense. Don't be surprised if in a bullpen game over here for Pittsburgh, uh, they just get taken apart a little bit. But I, 
I do like the price tags here. I'm going to obviously have Eddie Julian and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so no problem playing Minnesota. Uh, Mets short stacks for me, no Joey Lucchese, and a, a lot of the right-handers from St. Louis. Uh, no Zach Thompson either. So give me some, you know, Pete Alonzo, Frankie Alvarez, you know, whatever, Aruz. And from St. Louis, I like uh, full stacks for sure. White Sox, Colorado, offense definitely. Maybe a little bit of Michael Kopech is a really shrewd deep tournament play. Maybe even, could you get away with this in 20 max? Mm, I don't know. 7,300, kind of attractive. I'm really worried about the barrel rate and the walk rate, though. That, like, you just can't mess with that at Coors Field. Super, super dangerous. But I wouldn't be shocked if he pops here a little bit. Maybe for like 20, 22 or something. Uh, get some run support against Peter Lambert. It's a viable outcome, I think. Peter Lambert, no thanks. Colorado, I do like, obviously, targeting the walk rate and the barrel rate. Uh, so offense for sure. Maybe a Kopech team or two. Tampa and the Angels offense only here for me. Once again, no Tyler Anderson. I don't like this against Tampa. Uh, I think the upside is, is very much capped. And, you know, Tampa's a really viable stack now that they're not nearly as expensive anymore. Angels, too. Give me Shohei, Mickey Moniak, maybe a Moose from the left side. Um, Thice, Renhifo. Yeah, you can play some of these guys. No problems there. Arizona and San Diego. No Brandon Fott, definitely not. Maybe a little bit of Seth Lugo, I guess. Uh, but I kind of think Arizona could be viable here, too. Give me a lot of San Diego. I, I like this spot for them um, I, as a really off-the-board tournament stack. Baltimore and Oakland, I'm, I'm just going to leave Kyle Gibson off. He's going to be too popular for me. I can't read him. I can't trust him, so I'm not putting any money on him. Um, Luis Medina, same sort of deal. I don't like any of his numbers. I think he's overpriced uh, for this particular matchup. So give me some Baltimore pieces where they're well-priced. And Oakland, yeah, yeah sure. I mean, the token Seth Brown for me. Zach Geloff is 5,400 now. Even though he's got great numbers, that's kind of tough to stomach. So I'm not really thrilled about playing a lot of Oakland. Um, you know, so does that mean I want to play Kyle Gibson? Yeah, well, no. Uh, Miami, I think, is very shrewd tournament stack as well. Really interesting um, 20 max play here, I think, for the Marlins. Getting after some Tony Gonsolin. Guy I respect, but gives up fly balls and hard contact. So that's attackable. Give me maybe a little bit of Sandy, too, is a really off-the-board tournament play. Okay, that's it. We're done. Keep an eye out for projections and ownership updates, as always, as we will push them throughout the day. And good luck to everybody here on Friday's 12-gamer.